Hi everyone, it's Ajeanette Oberg, and I'm here to just kind of introduce you to some of the main components of your Chapter 1 lecture. There's a PowerPoint on Blackboard available for you to go through that kind of highlights some of the main concepts from the reading. And then additionally, when you do your reading, you'll get some of the more detailed information about the various subjects. And then I'm just going to give you a little video mini lecture to just kind of highlight some of the main ideas that you need to focus on. So chapter one lecture is actually um, primarily a publisher lecture. It's introducing you to some key terms and concepts that will be used throughout the course. And these are terms for which you should be really familiar. In general, just the definition of human development, looking at how we grow and change over time from conception through death. The various domains, specifically um, the areas of development that we're going to focus on, including physical or biological changes. That'll focus on bodily growth changes. It'll also focus on some brain development um, and other biological factors. Cognitive or mental processing, thinking, learning, language development. Psychological um, development and social and emotional development. Those are really going to look at kind of how our sense of self changes, how our identity emerges, uh, how our interactions and relationships with others might change, and what might impact those relationships over each developmental period. Uh, we In this particular class and, and this textbook, there will be a really strong emphasis on culture and looking at kind of a group's patterns, their customs, beliefs, um, sometimes their religion, technology, uh, how um, they're globalized as a nation, their industrialization, their infrastructures, comparing developed versus developing countries. We're going to look at the various cultural factors that help shape human development and how we are. And since we are more of a globalized world in that we're interconnected across continents, across countries, and across cultures, uh, it's really important to understand or to have a cross-cultural understanding of human development because what might be normative in our area or region may not necessarily be what's normative in other areas. So the first part of the book is going to kind of take you through some population trends and how um, you know birth rates have changed over times in different segments of the population and in different countries. The next part of the chapter are the um, uh, yeah the chapter is going to take you to really looking at the United States. We're really not having enough babies to maintain our current population level. But because of our immigration policies, um, and believe it or not, we do have more favorable and liberal immigration poli policies relative to other countries, um, we are able to continue to uh, grow in terms of population. Big differentiation between developed and developing countries. So really important that you focus in on your reading to understand this. Developed countries are the wealthier countries. We have developed infrastructures, policies, government. Developing countries are the much poorer countries that are very much in need of um, systems and supports and resources to sometimes provide for basic necessities like clean water um, or you know access to education. Interestingly enough, most of the world is in a developed country. The, most of the world's population lives a very significantly different lifestyle than we're accustomed to here in the United States. We are very privileged from a world standpoint. Even if you live in a lower SEO, SE, socioeconomic group or SES group, here in the United States, your quality of life is still substantially higher than those individuals living in developing countries. So really important to understand the wealth disparities and the population disparities between those types of countries. And then also um, that will factor into some of the different uh, ideologies of the countries and some of the cultural beliefs 
So SES is what I was alluding to earlier. It's your socioeconomic status, which includes your income, education, and occupational status. And then we differentiate between individualistic cultures that are more centered on the individual. The root word is the individual. Um, they promote kind of independence, self-sufficiency, personal freedom, individual choice, where you're kind of in control of your destiny and you're responsible for your individual success, happiness, um, and you, you bear personal responsibility for the consequences of your choices as well. So your individual achievement uh, is really prized in those cultures. Collectivist cultures are those that are more collective in nature. They're group focused. It's more social harmony, interdependence, um, looking at kind of the well-being of the group over the well-being of the self. It's really enough, not about your individual success, but the success of the entire group and the collective well-being of the group. So obedience, conformity are much more prized in those countries not as focused on self-esteem, but really focused more on other esteem. And so really important to look at the different cultures that we study and how these underlying cultural beliefs might guide their development, guide their perspectives and, and their behavior throughout life. Traditional cultures are those cultures that we find in rural areas of developing countries. Um, and they still may very much adhere to somewhat of a primitive lifestyle, especially relative to the lifestyle that we're exposed to. And they often subscribe to more of the collectivist values and, and much more traditional cultural views. We also will differentiate between majority culture, which is really the culture that holds the power of influence in uh, any particular country in in our case here and you should kind of go back as well and think of what countries might subscribe to individualistic or collectivist views and then here in our country think about what ethnic group or or what gender group or what um, sexual orientation might actually uh, hold the majority culture in other words they hold the power and the influence um, context is really important. We're going to talk about some theories later on that are going to focus on the importance of context and shaping our development. Um, and gender is a really important component. I, my identity and who I am and how I've responded within those contexts is largely influenced by the fact that I'm a woman. Um, men and women have different uh, cultural and developmental experiences based on how a culture might respect or view or value those genders differently. For instance, in some cultures, women are still very much treated as property um, and women are not afforded the same respect, rights, or privileges as males. In our particular culture, we, we see that dynamic changing, but we still very much see a privilege toward males in that we still have a glass ceiling effect. We still have a pay differential between males and females. So my gender very much, a uh, male having had my same background and experiences may have developed differently just by nature of being a male. And then ethnicity is also a factor. I come from a multi-ethnic background. I often describe myself as a burrito because I'm white on the outside and I'm brown on the inside. And I say that because I have a Caucasian father that has Swedish heritage, German heritage, high Irish heritage, um, but he also has a little bit of Native American and Jewish heritage. And then I have a mother who is predominantly French on her father's side and then Native Hawaiian. Her mother was, uh, was a um, Native Hawaiian, full-blooded Hawaiian individual. And so in my mother is brown skin. My siblings are all brown skinned because they took my mom's phenotype. I took my dad's Caucasian phenotype, but I very much grew up in that ethnic minority uh, household neighborhood. So I have a lot of the uh, minority culture and, and minority value systems impressed upon me uh, as part of my identity 
more so than just my outside wrapper. But that ethnic experience and seeing the differential treatment between myself, who has that kind of white privilege, versus my siblings who are very much brown and apparent minorities um, by looking at them visually, then, you know, I've seen how we were treated differently and how um, teachers and law enforcement and, and different groups and organizations respond to me very differently than my siblings or even my mother um, who was very much discriminated against her entire life. Um, by my own father's family and her grandmother or her, my grandmother, her mother was also rejected because she was part of the savages, that Hawaiian tribal um, group that was not uh, readily embraced in her generation within that larger um, Caucasian majority culture when she migrated here to the mainland after leaving the islands when she married my grandfather. So I still very much have, you know, some of those ethnic influences that have shaped my development in very distinctive ways. So I see the world very differently based on my ethnic experiences. So ethnicity is very much a part of human development and it's a significant component of shaping us. The next part of the chapter is going to go through some anthropological backgrounds. Um, talking about different uh, developmental approaches, talking about natural selection, the origin of the species, giving you some terminology that led to our development more from an in, in, um, evolutionary perspective and that evolutionary time frame of development. So looking at our species development more so than just looking at how an individual changes across their own, their own lifespan. So, um, this does, uh, I, I find it to be fascinating information. It does step outside of my realm of expertise because I am, I am a developmental psychologist. It is my, um, my master's, my background and training. So there is a lot of that anthropological information that's valuable. It enhances our knowledge and understanding of human development as a whole. So I'm thankful that human development is an interdisciplinary pers uh, um, discipline. Um, where we draw upon uh, the expertise and knowledge of different disciplines to come together to shape our understanding of how we develop as humans. So uh, we can rely on that anthropology for that supplement. Um, and then also, it's really important to, um, one element of uh, biological psychology is evolutionary psychology. So psychology isn't just one um, perspective. It's really a collection of perspectives. And the evolutionary psych psychology perspective really looks at trying to understand certain behaviors in terms of um, what evolutionary value or how did they contribute to our survival? Um, wh where was the adaptive value in a particular behavior such as fear, that fight or flight response, or jealousy, um, and how there might be gender differences in jealousy? So evolutionary psychology really tries to come up with explanations that explain why certain behaviors or social conditions might exist based on that um, survival component. So really interesting to kind of, you know, try to uh, explain and understand that element of why a particular phenomenon might exist. Um, and then the next section is going to go into theories. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to actually stop here and I'm going to do a second video that is going to go into the theories. So I have adequate time to cover the very general theories and perspectives within psychology. And these kind of are like our lenses. There are guiding principles to how we interpret information and how we kind of view experiences. So I'll look forward to seeing you in just a couple minutes.